Is it me? No one's watching yet, but yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Hey everyone. Um, good morning, West Coast. Uh, good lunchtime, East Coast. And happy afternoon, evening to those of us on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, it is five o'clock here, so I'm having a beautiful espresso martini. Um, remember these from the like late 90s, early 2000s? I used to drink kind of a lot of them, so I'm kind of happy they're back in vogue again. So uh, cheers to everyone. Clearly I'm not giving up alcohol or caffeine for Lent. Um, okay, so things are great here in Madeira, Portugal. Um, we've uh, as a lot of you know, we moved here about, well, early December. We packed up all of our belongings 134 days ago and everything just arrived today. So I'm gonna sleep in a proper bed tonight and I'm pretty, pretty excited. Um, so in advance, I'm gonna pardon if I cough or clear my throat a lot. Um, actually, part of the reason we left Vermont is the cold and our dusty road and the smoke from the wood stove all really affected my asthma and I had a hard time breathing uh, in Vermont more often than not. And I've been breathing great here, but we've been having these dust storms off the Sahara and it really got in my lungs. I hear it's clearing tomorrow and everything is going to be uh, paradise once again. Speaking of paradise, freesia just blooming in the yard. I didn't even know we had it. It's pretty fun to, well, it's always fun to move to a new place and see what's there, but particularly an entirely new climate where you don't even, you don't even know what you might expect. So uh, I wish you all to have carefree freesia blooming in your yards. Um, we'll get started talking all about Lysianthus here in a minute. Feel free to go on and let us know some questions. We're ready to answer them. Um, if you send us a question, give us your name and your location. That'll help me. Thank you for giving us a question. Um, it will also help me know where you are in case there's something specific about your location that might, uh, might help me answer your question a little bit better. Um, I should say we're also really excited, Felicia, who works with us, she actually does a whole lot with all the blogs and the growing guides and the, you know, there's kind of the more the increased resources we have available for all the growers out there. Um, Felicia's behind all that and she's actually here, she's upstairs right now, um, kind of prompting me from off screen. So I'd like to give a big thanks to Felicia. Um, we're really glad to have you here. And also Allie, who's not here right now, but she was here two weeks ago or last week, we had a little uh, little staff retreat here at our place in Madeira. So it was really fun to get everyone back together. Um, all right, so I've got 12 computers and phones here. Give me one second. Okay, if you go to farmerbailey.com, there's a tab that says growing guides. And if you look under there, you'll see Lysianthus. There's a lot of resources there already. We're going to talk through all of those today, but just know that that's always there for you if you need to refresh your memory. Um, there's a kind of a chart that just, you know, nitty gritty gets you through all the details. Um, and then there's also links to videos, links to culture sheets, um, which are just a wealth of information. You know, everything I've learned has been from reading all of this information that's out there. I try to credit everyone that's taught me anything about Lysianthus. And uh, yeah, there's, it's an easy crop, but there's a lot of mystique around it. The more you grow it, the better you will get at Lysianthus. Um, one more little housekeeping thing. We're starting to get into the really busy shipping season, which means you're gonna get your order soon, probably in the next four to six weeks, if you haven't received it already, depending on where you are. UPS and FedEx, by and large are excellent. They are, uh, they are our partners in this. Sometimes things just have a really rough ride. You know, there's, they're shipping millions and millions of boxes around the world every day. So if something falls over on its side, you might have plants that fall out. Just be ready for that. Have trays on hand, have some soil mix on hand. Um, I really like a 50 or a 72 cell tray. Um, just be ready. By and large, Lysianthus is one that doesn't really mind if you knock it around. It's going to be alive, it's going to be fine. Just take a deep breath. Um, if you're new to farming, let me tell you, there are many worse things than getting some plugs out of their trays. Uh, gotta have a little bit of a thick skin in this game, so uh, just, just be ready. Preparation will almost guarantee that you won't have any problems. Okay. 
We're gonna try something today with a little split screen where we show you some photos as I'm giving a presentation. Um, so bear with us, I think, I think we're gonna do pretty well at it. So I'm gonna give you kind of a, a version of a talk that I gave um, to some folks. Well, it was, on, it was online, it was to some uh, horticulturists in Kentucky, I guess back in November. Um, that whole talk is available for you to watch. We have a link to it on the website. But uh, we're gonna talk directly with you today. And once again, if you have questions, do let us know. And like I said, give us your name and location so we can have a little better idea of who we're talking to, okay? Um, we'll save questions till the end, but feel free to go on and ask them all throughout the talk. All right. Thomas is on the other side of the camera here, so. Hi, Thomas, thanks for your help today. Um, I'm just waiting for the photos to show up. It's okay. We, like I said, we're living in Madeira, Portugal now, but previously we were farming in Northern Vermont. This was our property where we grew a whole lot of Lysianthus as well as sweet peas and a bunch of other flowers. So I do have some experience with this. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of a lag here, so I'm... Sweet peas. Uh, yeah, so sweet peas were our primary cut flower crop. Um, and probably right after that was Lysianthus. Um, two things that we found did really well. Lysianthus is very heat adapted, but it also it does really well in the northern kind of cool parts of the country. Um, so it really is good for anyone anywhere in the U.S. All right, what do we have next? You all think sweet peas. Um, yeah, we definitely did. Uh, had had good luck with our cut sweet peas. We were shipping to New York before COVID, but then when then you know when that happened, there were no weddings and we weren't selling any peas anywhere. So. Um, that kind of changed our plan and our life forever. Brunch and Blooms. Uh, we did a lot of events on the farm. Our Brunch and Blooms events were very popular where we had, well, Thomas was a, is a pastry chef and he would cook a beautiful brunch spread and we would have just kind of a flower buffet for everyone to, uh, to enjoy. Um, we'll see if we get into something like that when we get a little more settled here. All right. Um, like I said, we did do some pretty good Lysianthus stems. I think this is maybe our, one of my first attempts at it. These are probably, uh, I don't know, 30, 30 inch tall Lysianthus. Um, the cool summers mean you only get one, one good flush out of it, but you get some really honking stems. Um, so Roseanne Lysianthus is the series that really kind of launched the whole Farmer Bailey brand in the first place. When I was a, uh, when I was a cut flower, um, well, I used to be a florist. I have a strong history of floral design. Before that, I studied horticulture at the University of Kentucky. So I know how to grow things and I know what the product should look like and what to do with it. Um, there's this little gap of information that I honestly learned everything I need to know from the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. I will always give a shout out to the ASCFG. But when I started looking for these brown lysianthus that I used to purchase from other countries, no one could get them for me. None of the brokers knew about them. Everyone just told me, no, no, no. Well, I didn't really take that as an answer. So uh, I figured out we could get seed. I just needed some people to go in on a big group order um, of plugs. So Grow and Sell agreed to grow the special order for me and some friends. And I think we thought it would be a one year adventure. Well, after that, I don't know. Uh, it, was, it, was a lot of, it was a lot of trades with Lysianthus. Um, a lot of you all just kept asking me for more and more things. So we kept on looking for more things. We formalized our relationship with Grow and Sell. So Lysianthus is really to, to be credited with Farmer Bailey as a business, um, with you know me being a small cut flower grower, helping other small cut flower growers all over the country. So Lysianthus will always be near and dear to my heart. Now you may have heard that Lysianthus is a tricky one to grow from seed, and that is true. Um, one of the biggest ironies of me moving away from the U.S. is that I can no longer get Lysianthus plugs, which I think is pretty funny since mostly what I do is supply Lysianthus plugs. Um, but these are some of the beautiful plugs coming from, from Grow and Sell. Um, we do get questions from people fairly often asking how to grow them from seed well. And if I really knew, I would tell you, I want you to try growing them from seed. If you do, you'll understand the value of buying plugs, honestly, but keep trying. Um, 
if you have trouble tracking down the, you know, the Google, or I'm sorry, the the culture sheet from uh, Cicada has a great one. Taki has them for most of their varieties. Um, you can just Google really any flower and culture sheet. You'll probably come up with a really good document. Um, if you're having trouble with that, just send us a send us a DM, send us an email. We can give you that link, no problem. I believe it's also on our website under our Lysianthus, in the growing guides on the Lysianthus tab. So uh, we're not trying to keep any secrets here. They're just really specific in what they need in terms of fertility, they need even moisture, they need even temperatures all the time. And it's really outside the realm of what most people can provide uh, under lights in their living room or, you know, any situations like that. All right, here's uh, some Chroma Lysianthus. This is a new one to us, I don't know, maybe five years ago. This was the first time I grew it. Um, we still have it. There's a, I'm really happy that there's a lot of these varieties that really weren't available in the U.S. until I started asking for them. And, uh, and now we still have them and they're, they're great varieties. They're, they're all still very much worth growing. Um, Chroma looks a lot like Lysianthus, I'm sorry, a lot like Ranunculus to some people. Um, but we'll, we'll go into different types of Lysianthus here in a moment. <clears throat> Pardon me one moment. So, any crop, not just Lysianthus. One of the first things to do is read about that flower in the wild. How does it grow? Where does it grow? Um, Lysianthus grows in the U.S. This is a Native American flower, and it looks like what you see on the screen right now. Um, it grows all over the lower mid, the lower middle part of the country, um, particularly in Texas, Oklahoma, um, into Mexico. There's some subspecies that grow into the Caribbean. It really doesn't mind really baking hot temperatures. Most of these places do have a cool period of the year, so it is a um, you know it does help if you have some seasonality. You can't just plant it into hot soil in a hot climate. It's, it's not tropical. Um, it usually grows along stream beds that go dry in the summertime. So deep in the soil, you'll find access to water. Um, thus, the roots tend to grow very long. They can be, you know, a couple feet long. So they don't mind to be dry and hot in the summer, but they're going to need kind of a cooler, moist part of the year. Um, and we'll talk about, we'll talk about how you establish Lysianthus in a little bit. All right, so there's more and more Lysianthus all the time. Um, we're going to talk about the kind of the different the different classes. So the first one would be the the doubles or the semi doubles, something like uh, like Arena, like ABC, Echo, Mariachi, Super Magic. These were some of the first, you know, more refined varieties that that we got, and they're still great. Um, I mean, Arena is still super, one of my favorites. Um, Echo is really solid for a, a group one. It's really nice and early. Um, so these just have, you know, you saw the wild one has, you know, five or six petals, maybe probably five. The doubles have 10 to 15. Um, you know, getting more towards that rose shape. There are some that are more, more rosy. Um, just really kind of smooth, beautiful petals. Probably the, the, back, the backbone of Lysianthus. All right, the next group or what we call the fringe types. And these are a little bit newer. This is kind of the style we started seeing from Japan five to 10 years ago. Um, they're now really kind of dominating the market. So Voyage is uh, one that I brought to you all, I think four or five years ago. It's now gone on, it's the, uh, a couple years ago, Voyage Light Apricot was the ASCFG cut flower of the year. And I have to agree. There's lots of petals. Each petal is, you know, got that little ruffled edge. Just these big, ruffled, full, you know, focal flowers. They're almost like peonies. They're, they take up the same visual space as a dahlia. They're just big. Um, only thing with these is you might want to try growing these in a hoop house because with all those ruffles and all those petals, they can hold some extra water. And that's, uh, you know, they can topple over sometimes. Some people do grow them outside. If you don't have a lot of wind and rain in the summertime, by all means, try growing them outside. They're the only ones that I uh, really say you should try to grow in a tunnel if you have that option. Um, so Voyage, excellent series. Uh, Corelli is slightly, it's not quite as double. You sometimes see the middle of Corelli, but the Corelli light pinks are just beautiful. Um, Celeb and Megalo are two new series that I introduced two or three years ago. 
Um, these are ones that I went to Japan to track down. I, you know, you're seeing all these gorgeous cut flowers coming in from Japan um, at the New York flower market and other big city markets. And I'm like, I want those. I need to know who is producing these. So now we have access to them uh, right here in the US. And I think they're, uh, yeah, I think they're gonna become some of our, some of our best sellers uh, year after year. All right. Um, the color range is improving on the in the fringe types all the time, but already it, it's quite wide. And the and the number of bloom groups. We'll get to what bloom groups mean mean in a minute. All right. So next we have what we call rose types. So one of the biggest um, the reasons that Lysianthus was developed into the cut flower it is today. <clears throat> and I should back up a little bit. It's only been about thirty years ago, maybe thirty five that someone, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know who, saw this you know, beautiful Native American flower and thought, geez, I could turn this into a really marketable cut flower. Um, a lot of the early work was done in Florida. Um, there's not a lot of you know, cut flower breeding work being done in the US, hardly at all anymore. Most of it's happening in Japan. And uh, so Taki, Sakata, Sumika are all excellent breeders. So one of the great things was, you know, you could have something that looks like a rose, but is an annual because roses take you know, some time to establish. They're thorny. There's a lot of, you know, they're really disease prone. So the, the thought of having roses that you could grow almost as an annual, even in colors that aren't available, um, you know, like purples, which are, aren't that popular with a lot of you, but worldwide, some of the purples and blues are very popular, um, especially in Japan. So the rose types, Rosita, Chroma, a rosa, very circular, very double. They can tend, they can look a little bit like ranunculus at times, chroma especially, but uh, when they're in bud, they just, they look very, very rosy. Yeah, I, I encourage just more of you to try these. They're not our best sellers. They're a little, very medium sized flowers, but you get a lot more of them per stem. So they're very, very worthwhile. All right, there are some that have been, well, the early, you know, the, the wild types were all single flowered, so single petals, you know, five petals. Um, and for a while, no one wanted that. They only wanted the big doubles. Well, then we got so used to seeing the big doubles that the singles started seeming really, really fun again. So this is Falda Yellow um, from Teki. Falda, you know, has that roughly petal, but you just get one, you know, one ring of them. So about five petals, but they're wide and they're really roughly. So, uh, Keep these in mind. Um, there was a series called Wondrous, which came in the same brown colors that we saw in Roseanne. Um, it's, um, it's been discontinued, but there's another new one called Solo, which is have the tiny little, tiny little purple and pink flowers, but there's so many of them on the stem. They're also, uh, they don't drop any pollen. I've never had a big problem with Lysianthus pollen, but the breeders have bred the pollen out of them, so they don't stain anything. They just last a long time. Um, Viviana is another similar one. It looks more, very small, very wispy, more of a wildflower. You would hardly recognize it next to, you know, Voyage. You might get four or five inches across, and Viviana is going to be maybe one inch across, but just so many of these dainty little flowers. Um, some of my favorites. Okay, looks like we have um, probably Little Summer on the screen at the moment. So then there's these novelty types that don't really fit into any other categories. Roseanne with its kind of weird browns and dark purples and blue, or not blues, dark purples, green, and like bright green, really bright green, and uh, a range of browns. We have a new one called Terracotta, which has just come out. We were able to secure seed for that. So uh, we, we have some of that in production already. Um, from Samika, Little Summer, very small flowers, but you know, once again, nice long stem plenty of buds on each stem. Um, Dublini, I really like, it's like the perfect little little boutonniere size or if you're making a flower crown or something. Um, Lysianthus holds up really well out of water, so it's great for personal work. And the, uh, the Dublini is, the plants are really short too. You're not gonna cut these big stems from Dublini. So I think Dublini is really great for a you know, a farmer florist who's growing for their own production, you can go out and just trim the buds you need and let more develop. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna talk for one second about the different bloom groups that we have in Lysianthus. So you'll see them listed as, most 
So we sell our one, two, and three. Um, occasionally we'll have, we have a couple, a couple varieties in the group four. So when you plant all of those together, the group ones are gonna flower first, group twos are gonna follow, then group three, then group four. Not too complicated, but to be more, more precise, it's a really complicated relationship between temperature, between light intensity, between day length, and between the size of the plant. So some of these plants, like group ones for instance, I think they need to have six or eight leaves before they're even capable of making a bud. Group twos need something like eight or 10 leaves. Group threes need 10 to 12 leaves. So it's, it's really hard to recommend exactly what group for you to plant in your location to achieve a certain bloom time. It's gonna have to be kind of trial and error. So I encourage you to keep notes every year. Um, you're gonna love having them whenever you do but they're really tricky to, to time unless you're growing in a heated greenhouse. You have very precise control over your daylight or your, well, daylight, but you also would need supplemental lighting from LEDs or high pressure sodium, um, your day length, your light intensity. And most of us don't have that. I, I wish we did. I wish I've always wanted to have that kind of facility. Um, you know, I was in Holland back in November visiting some of these facilities that produce 60 million stems per year. Um, really, really impressive, really energy intensive. And with the Ukraine-Russia situation, natural gas, you know, has gone up tenfold in price. Now, honestly, do we really need to be producing uh, lisianthus in February at a huge petroleum cost? I don't, I don't think we do. I think the best lisianthus comes when we grow it grow it locally and deliver it locally. So, uh, you know, plant some of each group, plant them at the same time, and then sort of learn what, when each one blooms. Sometimes there'll only be five or 10 days in between. The great part about Lysianthus, you don't have to cut it on any certain day. You know, a tulip, you have one hour in which you should be cutting it. Lysianthus, you could leave it there for up to three weeks, just trim off the dead flowers, let the other ones open. It's gonna still last beautifully for the end consumer. Okay. Got off track there, but that's, we get a lot of questions about bloom groups. Um, talked a little about, about growing lisianthus from seed. So here's a picture of a tiny baby seedling. This is probably two to three weeks old uh, in its little plug tray. You can see just how tiny that is. Um, so think about it. If you take a garden hose trying to water that, you're gonna wash it right out of its tray. So you really need to have like a fine mist system, which Grow and Sell has a beautifully automated system. Um, like I said, please keep trying to grow them from seed. I want people to become good seed propagators. It also will teach you the value of, it'll teach you what you're good at growing from seed and the value of your plugs. Okay. Um, so the Grow and Sell produces a really high tech facility. These would all be lisianthus trays that have just come out of the germination chamber, um, on their way to you, you know, nine weeks later. Um, it's a really long crop. It takes at minimum 10 weeks to grow, um, 10 to 12 weeks, depending on the variety, assuming all conditions are perfect. You know, you'll hear people talking about growing their own from seed. It might take them four months to get that little thing up to transplant size. Um, so really you're, and you're probably going to lose about half of them along the way. So I really admire, admire Grow and Sell for being able to produce these with such consistency um, and meet that ship date almost every time. If the plants are a little bit small, they're gonna hold them back for a week. We'll let you know about that. But nine times out of 10, they're on their way uh, right when they say they're going to be. Close up. All right, I think we've got another. So here's, you know, this, these are Lysianthus from Grow and Sell, just getting ready to ship. They are, uh, they're, they're just perfect. So the shipping boxes, like I'm sure you know, three trays per box is, is ideal. Um, it keeps things from moving around so much in the box. It also maximizes your shipping, your shipping dollar. Um, so whenever possible, do, do keep that in mind. Um, also, if you uh, are ordering, I think more than 35 trays, it doesn't have to be Lysianthus. But if you're in the 30 range, um, your, your plugs can ship on a pallet. 
So the pallet can't really tip over unless something just really bad goes wrong. Um, so keep that in mind as a possibility. <clears throat> um, yeah, or you know maybe you can go cooperate with someone else in your area, and that'll be a. They'll just be excited when you. I remember the first time I got a pallet delivered. I it was better better than Christmas by far. Right, so some we're gonna jump right into disease here, and disease is something you need to be thinking about from the moment they arrive, if not uh, a little bit before. So if you see something like what you're seeing in the middle of your screen there, you're probably looking at Fusarium. Fusarium is the primary fungal, the primary pathogen. It is a fungus um, of Lysianthus. There's several other root rot fungi out there. You have, I'm not even going to talk about them because Fusarium is probably what you have. However, if you see this, the first thing you should do is pull that out of the ground, put it in a bag, and get it to your state plant pathologist. Your state land grant university has a plant pathologist. They work for you. You know, you might have to pay five or ten dollars. It, it's probably free. Um, just test it and make sure you know what you're dealing with. You know, like I said, it's probably Fusarium, but don't go treating something unless you know what disease it is. If you have it this year, you'll see it again, so it's good, good to know. So what can you do? <clears throat> There's several things you can do to pre-treat your Lysianthus. The first thing you can do when it arrives, don't just put it in your driveway. Don't lay your tray on a bed of soil. Put it on a clean bench, because you're laying it on soil or something outside, you can start getting Fusarium uh, infection right away. Um, like I said, they're quite susceptible. Fusarium is everywhere. You have it somewhere on your property already, okay? Another way to help protect them is to pre-treat them with a, a fungicide or a biofungicide. So biofungicides are natural products that are primarily, they're either beneficial fungi, mostly bacteria that attach to the roots. They grow with the roots of the plants and they make a little, like a protective layer around the root of your Lysianthus. Um, root shield is a very commonly available one. Um, these things are alive, okay? So you need to, uh, you need to keep this stuff in the refrigerator, but you need to order it in advance because it, it can't just sit on your shelf year after year. That's about a one year shelf life. So maybe this time of year, it's a great time to go on, uh, go online and buy some root shield. I know, I know Johnny's has it. Uh, a lot of your greenhouse suppliers can get it for you. Um, like Arbico Organics, you know, th these kinds of companies can certainly get it. So perhaps at, when it arrives, dunk your trays in root shield Put them on a clean bench. Then right before you plant, there's another strain of, another type of biofungicides. You have uh, <clears throat> one called Prefence, one called Actinovate. They're similar, it's kind of proprietary. They don't tell us what is in these things. These are, uh, these are all OMRI certified organic products. The, uh, the, the recommendation is to treat with one of these products, let that establish, and then right before you plant, use the other one. I don't know that it matters which order you use. Um, but again, root shield, actinovate, prefence, they're going to help you cut off, uh, they're really going to help protect the plant from getting that initial infection. There are certainly chemical fungicides you can use. I'm not qualified to really recommend these. Um, feel free to email me. I can tell you one that I've used. I don't like using chemical stuff, but in some of our houses, we did, you know, have just get, have too much loss. So I, I have used some of the less the least the less toxic chemical products but if you can do it if you're not having a problem with fusarium great if the biofungicides work even better um, rotate your crop every year try not to plant lysianthus in the same bed every year particularly if you've had a bad outbreak um, soil soil steaming is one option to help sterilize your soil before you plant most of us don't have that kind of equipment it's really expensive it uses a ton of diesel to steam the soil so i don't know what's you know, I think I figured it would take me about a thousand gallons of diesel to steam our entire production house and probably two weeks of just burning fuel to steam our soil. And that didn't seem great for the environment either. So keep an eye out for Fusarium. The other thing to think about with Fusarium and all fun fungal diseases, airflow. You know, if you're in a greenhouse, keep that horizontal air, keep those fans going. 
keep your slides open whenever you can so you have that sort of you know flow for flow of natural air make sure you're not putting plants to bed wet nothing wants to be wet overnight and uh and pull out disease plants as soon as you see them okay enough about fusarium it's boring <laughs> um I get a lot of questions about, should I bump up my Lysianthus when it arrives? For most people, I say no. Um, it just takes more time, it takes more soil, it takes trays, it takes, you know, space in your propagation house. The plants are big enough, either in a 210 or a 125. The plug is big enough to go right in the ground, assuming your soil is ready. If your soil is not ready, or maybe you've had a heavy rain, or maybe you've got a snowstorm coming, you can hold your plants for about a week, maybe two weeks in their tray. Beyond that, they need to go in a, a bigger tray. They're, they're really prone to getting root bound. So keep that in mind. Um, some crops just need to, be, need to be planted on arrival, and I, I put Lysianthus in that group, okay? Um, like I said, keep a 50 or a 72 cell tray on hand in case things pop out. That's also the size tray I would recommend um, if you want to bump them up. On our farm in northern Vermont, we would sometimes bump them up just, I don't know, I think we're just kind of bored in springtime and the the houses weren't ready or maybe the cover blew off one of our greenhouses. We didn't have a place immediately ready. So no harm in putting them in a, in a tray. You just a sterile mix. Again, keep them off the ground. Don't let, um, you don't want soil contact at this stage because those, they're more vulnerable when they are younger. Um, the bright side is they're easier to transplant because they're bigger. Um, you're going to get flour a little sooner. You might get a larger finished product. But you need to think about your labor cost, your soil cost, and the cost of your tray. All right, spacing is another common question. How far apart should I put them? Uh, most people recommend eight plants per square foot. Now, if you're new, using the hand, standard Horta Nova net, that's about a six by six square. So if you put two of them in a square, that will result in an eight per square foot spacing. Um, this is what we always did. We never pinched our Lysianthus, we just let them grow tall, so I had one premium stem with multiple flowers on it. Um, if you don't need that stem length, you can pinch your Lysianthus when it, you know, probably has six or eight leaves, just pinch the tip out. In that case, I would probably put one plant per six inches, so four per square foot. Because it's going to branch and you're going to have more stems coming up in that same space. They're going to be shorter, they're not going to have as many flowers. But they can, you know, if you make a lot of mason jar arrangements, um, they can be very usable. That could be a, a good way to, um, you know, if you, don't, if you don't need that big, big long stem. Ultimately, you can, you can uh, pinch half your crop to get, you know, medium-sized stems, and they'll bloom a little bit later than if you don't pinch the crop, which will give you the tall stems. Um, I always use two layers of support netting because our lysianthus got so tall and those big roughly doubles are so heavy. Um, there's nothing worse than walking out right when they're about ready to bloom and they've all fallen over and then they start growing again. And then you, you know, everyone likes a little curve, a little motion, but I don't want to pick, you know, 500 stems of crooked Lysianthus. Um, some of you don't use netting and I applaud you if that works. Um, start with two, two layers of very well secured netting. And if you feel like that's overkill, go to one. Um, you've been warned. So when I was in Japan in 2019, um, I saw, went to a lot of Japanese producers. They were leaving this little gap down the middle of each bed, which I hadn't seen anyone doing in the US. <clears throat> so I talked to them about it. It's really so you get airflow down the middle of the bed. Also, Fusarium tends to travel kind of root to root underground. If you see one plant affected, you'll the next group around it will be the next group affected. So if you have this gap down the middle, you're stopping, it's like a, little, a firewall from, uh, you know, from disease transmission. So you're getting better airflow and you're also getting um, the benefit of having that little space. So I started doing that and I really like it. I also tend to leave about a foot in between varieties um, just so there's a breaks down the bed. So if you do have a localized breakout, you can well, you can just isolate it and it won't spread like wildfire down your entire bed. Um, so here's another, this is the, the last photo is mine. And this photo is from Japan. They just grow everything at such a, 
yeah, the, the quality level is just remarkable. Um, so we'll talk about when to harvest them. You're gonna see one flower on your Lysianthus and you're gonna be really excited and you're gonna be tempted to go out there and cut a bunch. I encourage you to cut that first flower off. Either you can let it open, you know, some of them will have a, still be this long, you could use them in a small jar arrangement. Um, better for the plant if you went out and pinched that first flower out. I know it's gonna hurt your feelings, but if you pinch it out, then you're gonna get more, more energy going to the next ring of flowers. And you usually have three or four of those that are all about the same size or at the same stage of development. So you have your one bud here, I would take that out. And then you have three or four that are all gonna open at the same time. And there's gonna be probably two more, two or maybe three more rings of flowers. Um, the Japanese tend to pinch out all the tiny buds because they wanna, they prefer to have four beautiful, four giant flowers than four medium flowers with four buds with four tiny buds. Um, it's just up to you. It's a lot of extra labor to pinch those buds out. I think the only one you really need to worry about is just go ahead and take out that first one. It's not that usable and it'll send a lot of extra energy into the, uh, the finished product. Okay. <clears throat> we talked about removing buds. I tend to, I tend to harvest when that second tier of flowers are fully open. Um, you can get them just before they're fully open. There's no harm in picking Lizzie Anthus fully open. It's still going to last a week, 10 days. And then, you know, additional buds do keep opening to a point. They're often a little faded or a little, uh, you know, maybe not quite as brightly colored, but they're still, still lovely, still beautiful. Um, like I said, there's no need to harvest them on any certain day. If you don't have a customer this week and you've, you know, you know someone who's got a big wedding next week, just hold off, leave them in the field. As long as there's still more buds on the plant, they'll still be worth cutting next week. Um, Lysianthus is also great. They don't need a lot of a fancy post-harvest treatment. Um, something like a Chrysal number two, a holding solution is all you need. I tend to, you know, make sure, obviously no leaves underwater, we all know this. Cut them, put them right in the Chrysal number two, pop them in the cooler. They can, stay, they can stay in the cooler for at least a week or 10 days um, and then still have another week or 10 days of life after that. I'm being really conservative with the numbers I'm giving you. Lysianthus can last for three weeks. Um, it's, it's kind of magical. It just keeps on, keeps on giving. It's actually kind of bad at farmer's markets because people would come back and like, oh, I don't need flowers this week because last week still looked good. So ideally a flower will last six and a half days so that you have to buy it again the next week. Okay, I think we're going to move on over to questions now. I'm seeing lots of them. Felicia has been watching this also and is kind of editing. Uh, um, oh yeah, a bunch of questions. So I'm just going to go right down the list. Um, they may not be in any particular order. Um, Sharoni Kelly from Modesto, California is asking, um, why do purple, and I'm going to say lavender, Lysianthus bruise or show damage unlike other colors? I don't know why, but you are correct, they do. Um, most flowers have multiple layers of cells in the petal, and I think maybe the purple ones just don't have as thick of a petal, so it's just a little more susceptible, or it doesn't dry off as quickly, or doesn't shed water as quickly. Um, yeah, I would put your, your purples, your lavenders in a high tunnel if you can to keep the water off. Um, you probably have something that's probably a botrytis issue as well. You know, when you have droplets sitting on a plant too long, botrytis, another fung, another fungal disease, which is pretty much everywhere. Um, those little spores will germinate and they'll start growing into the petal. And that's when you see those spots and, uh, yeah, you can't really fix it once you start seeing it. So. Keep them dry, keep the airflow up, and try to put your purples and lavenders under cover if you can. You know, maybe you live in a desert environment or somewhere with really, with really uh, um, a dry atmosphere, you, you wouldn't have to do that. All right. Okay, got a question from Morningside Meadows in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. 
um, asking about succession planting. We talked a little bit about Lysianthus numbers, so I'm not going to get into that again. There's something I've... I'm glad you asked this. So succession planting with Lysianthus is possible. The thing to remember about Lysianthus is you want to plant it when you have cool soil. So preferably below 55 degrees. That's generally going to be a couple weeks before your last frost if you're growing outside or maybe four to six weeks before your last frost if you're growing in a high tunnel. If you plant into hot soil, something called rosetting happens. That's a stress response to the plant rather than you know starting to elongate and move towards flowering. It just becomes this tight little ball of leaves. It thinks it's going to a hot desert summer and it's not gonna flower for you. Um, it'll probably flower next year if you can keep it alive, but you want them to flower this year. That's the idea, right? So plant into cool soil. The best way to manage, to get a longer bloom of uh, Lysianthus is simply to plant multiple, multiple groups. You know, as I mentioned, you could pinch out, you could pinch some that will kind of alternate when you get flowers. Like I said, if you pinch them, they're going to be a little shorter. If you don't pinch them, they're going to be taller. But there are situations where you might not be too concerned about the length. It might be more important to you to have a succession. Um, kind of in the southern half of the country, maybe the southern two-thirds of the country, you can get a second flush on your Lysianthus. So when you cut, cut them right, not quite to the ground, maybe leave four or six leaves, and then they will branch out again. Give them a good water, a good feed at that point. Um, Lysianthus is not the heaviest feeder, just needs pretty, pretty general fertility. Um, yeah, that's how I would try to spread out your season. Like I said, they're hard to account, they're hard to stagger unless you have um, just really top-notch automated, you know, technically, technically controlled greenhouses. Um, Kelly's asking about how to grow them from seed. Like I said, I'm not a seed growing expert from, for Lysianthus. I can grow kind of anything else from seed pretty well. Um, but just send us a DM, we'll send you the cicada culture sheet or you can Google it and find it yourself. It's also already on our website under the growing guide section under Lysianthus. All right. Uh, someone in North Florida is asking about, can you grow them in North Florida? You can, because you have a cool part of the winter. Um, you know, plant them, I plant in December or January probably, just to give them a couple few weeks of cooler weather before the real heat comes. Now I know nowadays we can't really count on that cool period, but but that's the best thing you can do. You know, maybe use a silver or a white mulch on your crops that'll help keep your roots cool. You really just need to keep them cool for about two or three weeks, gets their roots established, and then they can start taking some heat. Um, I would imagine, unless you're getting you know hundred over the you know beyond hundreds for long periods of time, you should have a pretty good pretty good luck in most of Florida with Lysianthus, probably getting even two or three flushes of bloom. All right, uh, Be Worthy Farms in San Diego, I'm assuming California, says, Lysianthus seem like they're overwintering and starting to make a comeback. Can they be a perennial? If so, how do I care for them staying in the ground? Um, Lysianthus in the wild are perennial plants. We've bred them into more of this annual model, but they can certainly overwinter as long as they're not dropping below 20, 25 degrees too often, okay? Um, but there again, Fusarium likes it cool and wet. So if you have a, win you know, a soggy winter, you're probably gonna lose them over winter. But if you have the space to devote to them and they're still looking fine going into fall and you're in like a seven, eight, nine uh, zone, there's no harm in letting them stay in the ground. They, they might just come back for you. Um, Barbara, Miami seeing a lot of losses from Fusarium. Yeah, um, something like Root Shield, something like Actinovate, um, Rotation, improve your airflow. Miami's just gonna be hot and humid, so it's probably gonna be really, maybe a tricky crop for you. Um, you know, that'd be a good question for your, uh, your state extension office. They can probably maybe help you talk about some, some strategies that work with you know, with your growing conditions to keep Fusarium at bay. This is a very common problem, so let's just be honest about it. All right. Um, 
Blair House Blooms in Massachusetts, what's the latest you would recommend planting out plugs without cover? Um, like I said, they want a couple weeks where the soil hasn't gone above 55. So two or three weeks before you would be planting your zinnias, you should be fine to put your lysianthus in the ground without any kind of covering. I didn't really talk about hardening off. If you're planting in a high tunnel, you don't need to harden off. Um, the high tunnel has enough protection from the UV rays of the sun. It's not going to be a problem. Also, if you're using frost cloth, you, maybe you're planting while you're still getting some hard frost. That's fine. Lysianthus doesn't mind dropping down, dipping down to 20 if it's in the ground. If it's in the tray, don't leave it outside if it's going to drop below 20 degrees because the roots are not protected. Soil is a great insulator. It holds a lot of heat, a lot of thermal mass. So if you have them in the tray and it drops down to 20, you're going to freeze those roots and you probably will kill the plug. So they don't mind down to 20 if they're in the ground. Um, you might want to put a little frost cloth over them. There's another instance where you don't need to harden off if you're putting some frost cloth. By the time they start to grow, by the time spring is springing, you can pull that cloth off and they'll be fine. If you want to plant them out in full blazing sun, um, I recommend three or four days, move them kind of in and out, put them in the garage, set them outside for a few hours, um, just to get them more accustomed to your conditions. So we have this notion that hardening off is about temperature. It's really more about the sun, you know, just being ready to get the full strength of the sun. And it's about uh, just water loss, you know, being able to cook, to cope with air movement. So in the greenhouse at Grow and Sell, everything is automated and perfect. They have perfect humidity, perfect light all the time. Um, you have much more extreme conditions in the outside. So that's why, that's why we harden off. Um, but you don't have to harden off if you plant in the tunnel and if you put some, or if you put some frost cloth over them at planting. <clears throat> um, question from Apex, North Carolina. Is it okay to spray Companion Max biofungicide? Um, I don't know this product, but I would imagine it would be fine. Um, they're not terribly delicate plants other than they are susceptible to fusarium. So if it's labeled for, label for use uh, on ornamental plants to prevent fusarium, give it a try. Um, all right, so the two people are talking about, uh, you know, maybe they didn't get their orders in. We talked about this two weeks ago, so you can go back and watch that. Our available now inventory goes up on Fridays. So we purposely grow some extra stuff so we have some wiggle room to help you, well, to help us make you happy. So perhaps, you know, these are live things. Grow and Sell is an excellent grower. Sometimes they will have a crop failure and we like to have something to, you know, put in that box. Something is better than nothing, right? But we purposely grow a lot extra so we have some to sell to you if you didn't order in time. So available now, goes up on Fridays. That stuff ships the next, the following Tuesday. Um, usually goes up sometime in the noon hour Eastern time. Um, like I said, it's not, it's not, we never know exactly what we're going to get. We don't know when we are going to post it. So if you haven't ordered, keep an eye on there. That's where you can maybe still get some stuff um, this season if it's too late for us to start. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Lysiantha takes about 12 to 13 weeks for us to sow and grow to that tiny size to ship to you. So we need to know well in advance when you want Lysianthus. This year we just had such demand that we filled up the facility at Grow and Sell sooner than we had expected. So my advice to you is be ready. I think October 2nd this year is when we will open ordering for the following spring. So get that order in in October to early November, probably till Thanksgiving is fine. But after that's when things start to get a little hairy because we just don't have room to grow it. Um, we can't stack them up. They have to be laid out on the bench. So um, I'm sorry for, I'm sorry to the people who were a little late or maybe are used to ordering later. Um, I wish we could have helped you more. And that's all I have to say about that. Um, so how to use Root Shield on Lizzie's. Root Shield is going to come with, um, with directions. It, it's very common in the, in the bedding, the bedding plant industry or hanging basket industry to use products like Root Shield um, as a drench. So just kind of calculate the area that you are trying to cover, mix 
accordingly. You know, it is a, it's an organic product. It's, you know, virtually non-toxic. So essentially you're mixing it in a water bath and I dunk the whole tray. I would try to get in the leaves everywhere. Um, you really want to saturate the soil with those root shield actinovate type products. Um, someone saying that their plants arrived and they, the boxes were on their end. Is there any way to ensure that they don't do that this year? Um, there is not. I don't have any control over FedEx or UPS. Um, like I said, you know, you think of a plant like a snapdragon that has a stalk or, or stock has a stalk. Um, if that snaps in transit, that plant's probably not going to recover and that plant is probably dead. Something like a Lysianthus is more rosette shaped. So you have probably four, probably four leaves when they arrive, maybe six, and the roots. The growing point is down in the middle of that, so it's pretty well protected. It's pretty uncommon that um, a Lysianthus plant is going to be dead on arrival. It might, if it's gotten shaken out of its tray, it's going to look scary. Put it in a, you know, put it in a 50 or a 72 cell tray with a sterile, so, uh, sterile soil mix, and most likely it's going to be just fine. Um, I've had entire trays dumped out that I then put, you know, into a new tray. You would have no idea come harvest time which had trouble in shipping and which did not. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, so I was asking what the F1 designation means in Lysianthus. Um, they have saved Lynn Berry, I think, the save seeds, and they germinated. Um, F1 just denotes a hybrid. So anytime you have, um, you know, plant one, plant two, you cross them together, you have a hybrid plant. So the Lysianthus, well then with that you get hybrid vigor. This is kind of going back to high school biology. Um, you know, you cross a mule, I'm sorry, you cross a horse with a donkey, you get a mule that is stronger than either and, you know, suits certain purposes. So F1 just means it's a man-made hybrid specifically because that combination gives you a really great result. Bigger flower, more ruffles, more, you know, longer stem, better base life. Um, if you save seed from that, they will bloom, they'll be Lysianthus, but they aren't going to be um, like the F1. They won't be like the first generation. Um, there's no no telling what they're going to be like. Um, they're probably still going to be long stem. They're probably still beautiful, but they may all be an entirely different color. Um, I think it sounds fun. I love to breed plants, so have fun with that. Um, so fertility, asking if, uh, you know, uh, does balanced fertilizer mean use 10-10-10? General fertility to me means I've done a soil test and I've taken the recommendations of that soil test to balance my soil. Now, 10, 10, 10 does have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in equal amounts, um, but that might not be what you need. So this is also a great time of year to get that soil test. A lot of places you can get recommendations on how to, you know, let them know what you're growing. University of Maine is really great. They will customize your test or your, the recommendations. Um, if you're organic, if you're growing cut flowers, they're there to help you. I hope other states do that as well, but you really want to balance out to just general fertility that would grow most plants well. They're not particularly hungry in any certain area. Um, in terms of organic fertilizers, I mean, compost is going to be the best way to keep fertility in your soil. Certainly seaweed, um, chicken litter, there's, again, there are organic um, recommendations available from soil, so from some soil testing companies. So I would trust the experts, don't just wing it. Another question about perennials, yes, some Lysianthus can be perennial. Um, as long as you're not soggy, as long as you're not dropping much below 20, they should, they, they may well, uh, they will work. How many sims can you, expect per plant. Um, that's going to depend a lot on how you're growing them and where you are growing them. I, in Vermont, got one giant stem per plant. Now people, you know, if I'm in the middle, middle tier of the country, often get a second flush, so they might be getting one great stem and then four or five smaller stems. In the southern tier, you might get three flushes, so you, you could be looking at seven to ten stems per plant. Generally, don't count much 
you know, your best stem is going to be that first one. Don't count on too much more than one stem per plant, but it, it is possible you could get more. <clears throat> um, so I thought if your crate planting is eight per square foot, still recommended. I thought 10 was okay. I don't, I haven't grown Lysianthus in a crate. Um, it uses, you have to buy soil and it's harder for me when I've grown things in crates to keep them well watered. Um, the advantage would be you could buy, you know, a sterile potting mix. You might be able to crowd them if you're, you need, you need plenty of room for that flower to develop. If they're too cramped, you're just going to reduce the overall size and quality of your stems. So maybe you could put 10 in a crate and space them out a little bit more. Um, there's no one commercially, you know, in terms of like Holland or Japan, they're not growing them in crates. So there aren't recommendations for that. That's going to be something for you to figure out on your own. Uh, what's the first bud that you pinch? Where is it? It's the first flower that you see opening. You'll start seeing a little color. You know, it's the first one that's going to get big. Um, it'll be green to start with. Then just pinch it out. Doesn't have to be hard. It pops right out. You can also let it, you can let it open and cut it later. That's fine too. Or you can let it open and put it in a little bud vase or in a little jelly jar. Um, there are people who, who, who use those and make money from them. So that's great. Um, do you add chrysal to the base? Yes. Um, so I use the number two solution, the holding solution in the cooler. Then number three is the more, the retail solution that helps flowers to develop. That'll help get those little buds opening. Um, so when you put it in a vase, by all means, use a flower food. Um, flower foods are a combination. They're really simple products. There's an acid in there, usually citric acid. There's sugar because sugar is carbohydrates and carbohydrates feed all living things, including flowers. And then there's some kind of um, something that prevents bacterial growth. So the acid is primarily what prevents bacterial growth, but there's probably some other sanitizer in there that helps, you know, keep everything clean. Um, and that keeps your stems drinking, keeps bacteria from clogging things. So I'm a big fan of, um, of using post-harvest solutions. Someone said they were told not to use weed fabric. Um, but I use it. So, uh, if you like weeding a lot, then you don't have to use it. Um, when you're planting so close, it's really hard to get in between, especially when the plants start to get a little bigger. But if you have really great weed control, you don't have to use it. Um, you know, if you're using the woven plastic, the landscape fabric, which is still just plastic, um, and you plant in the hot summer, that black plastic can just get scorching hot. It might seem like a 75 pleasant, you know, 75 degree day, but you can really cook your stuff if you're not careful. So make sure you water well, overhead water, overhead water when you plant your plugs. I'm sorry, I didn't say that earlier in the presentation. All plugs need to be overhead watered when you plant. The roots do not extend beyond that little bit of plug. So it doesn't matter if there's a drip, you know, your drip irrigation is right here and your plug is right here. It can't access that at all. So you, probably for the first couple of weeks, you need to be overhead watering with a hose, with a sprinkler. Um, Lysianthus is no exception. Um, if anything, it needs, it needs some, uh, maybe a little extra water when it's young. Um, Kate says some Lysianthus, the sole wholesaler will look great initially, then it will get, will notice droopy thin stems. Can I do anything to prevent this? Um, I don't know where you are or what wholesaler you're using. It sounds, I used to need to buy some wholesale flowers sometimes that would look great and then they would fall apart. Usually because the wholesaler was keeping them in their cooler for three or four weeks before I walked in to buy it. So assure that your stuff is fresh when you're buying it. Um, it could be botrytis. Botrytis affects cut stems as well. It will keep developing in those cool damp conditions of a cooler because the humidity is almost 100% in a flower cooler. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry if that's your only wholesale option. Um, try, try to get them fresher, try to find them from a, a local grower if you can. Um, someone in Charlottesville just got some plugs. They're beautiful. There's a wedding at the end of June. Will they be blooming in a high tunnel by that time? Um, Usually July is when most people in the middle tier of the country start seeing them. It's going to be right on the edge. Um, you know, let them settle in. 
you know, with that cool soil for two or three weeks, and then maybe keep your, keep your high tunnel closed a little bit to get those day temperatures up into the 80s, get that soil a little bit warmer. That'll push them into flower a little bit sooner. Um, Rusty Shovel Gardens in Minnesota, they have a lot of late frosts. Should they plant even though you'll get a frost? Yep, that's fine. Right now in the 20 degrees is fine. Lysianthus does not mind a frost. Um, I do like remay, frost cloth, whatever you want to call it. Always a good idea. Uh, favorites for outdoor growing. Any of them can be grown outside. The double, the big doubles just collect more water and they are more prone to toppling over. Um, wind pressure, that's, you need to plant it, you need a wind break or something. The, there are no varieties that will do better or worse with wind. I mean, probably the bigger ones would be worse in wind because they're gonna just get blown around more. So some of the single, smaller flowered ones might be better. Um, someone asking what groups the Celeb series are in. Um, a lot of them are two, but there are some ones and threes. So they're, they're kind of across the board. Um, it started as two, but there are, they're branching out. What's the latest you would plant? Lizzie in Central Texas. Again, they want to go into cool soil, um, probably around now. I don't know what your weather is like in Central Texas at the moment, but better to plant them into cool to cold soil rather than uh, above 50, 60 degrees. Like I said, just kind of think about zinnias. Like we all kind of understand tomatoes and zinnias when to plant those. You need to be planting them three weeks before you feel comfortable planting your zinnias outside. Um, so some varieties like Megalo, got a question from Barbara in Miami. How hot can things like Megalo handle it? It's really just gonna be, uh, you know, probably somewhere they planted them side by side, one variety fell apart, Megalo was still good. I don't think we actually have exact numbers to go on there. Um, you know, I was in Japan in July, it was really hot and sticky and everything was still holding up beautifully. Um, sorry, I don't have a more exact answer there. Just, just relative to the other varieties, they will take more heat. Um, they do still need cool soil to start because they will rosette if you plant them into hot soil. Um, how to plant ship. Um, there's a whole thing on our website about how the plant ship is three per box. Um, you know, asking what we do if it's going to be hot. They, they're insulated. Um, the box is insulated, so that does help with the heat. You know, if it's super hot, they'll hold back. If it's super cold, grow and sell will hold back plants for an additional week sometimes. Um, ideally, you're getting your lysianthus before, you know, super heat waves, but I understand that things are really uh, unreliable these days. Um, Cause we've been going a little more than an hour. I said we'd go for an hour, but I'm having fun. I'm just going to keep plowing through these questions. I've hardly touched my cocktail. Pardon me, it's already six o'clock here. All right, let's just keep going. Um, do you foliar feed Lysianthus? Um, you certainly can. They have a kind of blue-gray color to them. They're sort of glaucous. The um, water doesn't stick that well. So you might want to use some kind of spreader or sticker if you're going to do a foliar feed on your Lysianthus. Um, you can also put root shield or actinovate these biofungicides in a foliar feed. Um, that would be a, a good way to just, if you're spraying something already, you may as well you know, reduce your chances of fusarium. Uh, how do you shade cloth to maximize stem length? Is it necessary since they can take the heat after roots are established? I did use shade cloth on our greenhouses. I grew Lysianthus in the same houses as our sweet peas where I was trying to keep things cool. I put about a 30% 30 uh, shade. And I did that probably well, whenever things felt like they were getting pretty hot, you know, late June is when we would put it on. Um, and then I kept it on. Um, yeah, it's, you, you won't hurt anything by putting a 30% 30, 30 shade on your, on your greenhouses. And they will, that will give you um, some longer stem length. Sean asked what I'm drinking. Uh, well, that is an espresso martini. I recommend it. Um, research was for Canadians. We get a lot of questions about Canadians. I'm sorry, I don't have 
a good recommendation. Um, we've done some trial shipping to Canada. Unfortunately, things get held up um, for many days at the border, which I don't understand because we import just tons and tons of you know potted plants and cut flowers from Canada that flow very freely into the US. But for some reason going the other way, there's always trouble. Um, and the if things are held up for more than a day, it's just not possible for us to ship across the border. I wish we've been, uh, we've been trying. Um, it's like Janice um, of Harris Flower Farm said there's lots of information on the Canadian Fresh Flower Farmer Facebook group. So check there. Um, maybe some Canadians can help you figure it out. I wish, I wish I could, because we, you know, used to, our farm was just 20 miles from Canada in the past, and I know lots of great Canadians. Okay. Oh, someone asked, I missed this. Where are you right now? I know your farm is in Vermont. Um, actually, we are living in Madeira Island, Portugal now, so, uh, other side of the Atlantic. Um, yeah, it's good. We, we really like it here. Really beautiful, magical place. Weather is mild all the time. I have been starting my own Lysianthus because I can't get plug shipped from the U.S. either. Um, but I can just grow them outside in a plug tray and they're doing pretty well um, because they're getting full sun, they're getting nice humidity. So unfortunately, not everyone has this climate, but I specifically chose this place because it's good for flowers. <laughs> And generally good for my lungs. All right, um, we're gonna leave it at that. Um, if you haven't ordered your mums, the uh, cut flower mums, um, we did a presentation a month ago that's still available on our website. Um, that deadline is Sunday at 5 p.m. So make sure you get that order in because otherwise you won't have a chance to get them this year. Um, Thomas, anything else? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you tuning in. As always, email us if you have other questions. If you have questions specific to your order, um, we're always willing to help. Also, take a minute to poke around our blog, poke around our growing guides. There's a lot of information that we've been putting up there with the uh, professional help of Felicia. She's also our good friend, and she's hiding upstairs feeding me questions. So thanks again. Um, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Oh, if you have any ideas for other topics you'd like us to talk about, um, just shoot us an email, send us a DM on Instagram. Um, I don't personally love Instagram, but I know all of us are on there and we, it's just an easy way to reach a lot of people and to have this kind of informal conversation. So uh, anything that's you think would be a great topic for a conversation or anyone you think I should interview, we'll probably do a little bit more of that kind of stuff too. All right, thanks everyone.